Hi guys, thank you all so much for coming out right now. Uh, my name's Leanne Aguilera. I'm a senior writer and producer for Entertainment Tonight, and I'm so thrilled to see all of you Shonda-loving faces out there right now. Now, if you guys have a TV screen, a laptop, a phone, a tablet, chances are you've binged a whole season in one sitting of a Shondaland show. They are so deliciously addictive. And tonight we are going to dive headfirst into a conversation with two of uh, Shondaland's most insightful and inspiring women. Uh, so let's go ahead and bring them out here right now. And then I know that you guys wrote down some questions, so we'll be getting to those later. Uh, but please help me in uh, welcoming Allison Akel, who's the head of comedy and drama for Shondaland. <laughs> and Sarah Fisher, who's the head of production of Shondaland. Hi. 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 Look at all these lovely Shondaland loving faces who have joined us tonight. Hi. First of all, nice ladies, thank you. you so much for coming out right now. We really appreciate you shedding some light onto the production side of things in this industry. It can be so cutthroat. Uh, before we get started into what your roles are within Shondaland, I was wondering if you could kind of give us a little bit of a snapshot of your career journey and the paths that you took in order to get to where you are today. So Allison, you want to kick things off? Uh, sure, actually. I acted as a kid, so I always knew that this was some an industry I wanted to be in, but it very quickly became clear that uh, that was not going to be my calling, and then I moved on to writing. So I actually, while an undergrad uh, at Georgetown University, happened to be there at the same time it's, uh, as some people who were doing comedy and playwriting and screenwriting, like Mike Birbiglia, Jonah Nolan, Nick Kroll, John Mulaney, all those kids, and it suddenly made it feel like that might be a plausible thing that we could all do. Um, and so I applied to grad school, got an MFA in screenwriting, uh, moved out here in 07, uh, got the first job I could in marketing at Paramount Pictures just for, you know, a paycheck and experience and realized yet again, maybe the writing thing was not what I was supposed to do. So a lot of false starts. Uh, and then I, what I realized is that what I actually liked was working with writers. Like I missed workshopping. I didn't miss being alone in a room typing away uh, for hours on end. And so... Um, I ask people, how do you move from marketing into being an assistant in development and production? And everyone's like, oh, you got to go work at an agency, which to me felt really unappealing as someone who felt old at 28 starting out out here and knew that that meant taking like a huge pay cut to go be screamed at. And I was like, oh, is there any other way? <laughs> um, and luckily I was at Paramount, but someone at Paramount Vantage needed an assistant. And long story short, that woman, Rachel Egabine, who was a great mentor to me, was the person who like six years later, when I was at Ellen DeGeneres' company, was like, would you ever come to Shondaland? We want to do comedy as well. We need another exec. And so she was the person who was thoughtful enough to kind of bring me into the fold. And so that's how I wound up there. That's the quick. <laughs> Can you hear? Yeah. Oh, are you on? Is it working? Yeah. 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 Okay. Sultry. Take it away, so Sarah. I may have met a lot of you because for many years I was on set. So I started out. Uh, I wanted to work in sports, and I worked for a sports agent, and that was my first job out of college before there was really agents, and I worked my butt off in the office, like the girl in the office, and then uh, after a year, he came in and he said, I don't want you here anymore. I was like, what? I'd only gotten A's in college, and I, I just wish I worked so hard, and his best friend said, before you get your next sports job, come and work with me, and he worked... Uh, ran and then owns a company called EUE Screen Gems. You guys might know it because he has the studios in Wilmington now and in Atlanta. But it was a commercial company where he paid us $150 a week. And we did everything. But he said, keep track of your days because I can't remember. I think it was 400 or 600 days you could get in the DGA as an AD. So I did that. Then all of a sudden, I'm in the money. And I go, oh, I got to try to get my sports job and I was lucky enough to be one of the first two women hired at CBS Sports in a day when there was nobody. But I have to tell you, it was like a pretty shitty job, but my girl, <laughs> when you look back, but my girlfriend, I just have to brag about her, the girl, she and I started the same day, they must have had a quota, we didn't realize till a couple years ago. Um, she's the only woman directing NFL to this day still. It's pretty sick that she that took so long. So anyway, I worked in sports, and I had to move to New York for that. And then um, I got hurt on a remote, had to have surgery on my hand, moved back home. 
you know how it goes. Someone tells you, someone tells you to call this person. I end up meeting Abby Singer, who you guys know is the Abby Singer shot, um, who passed away two years ago. But Abby um, was head of production at MTM. And I was a first AD for commercials. I was a associate director in sports. And then that meant I could be a second AD in scripted. So I started MTM, totally dating myself, on Remington Steel, St. Elsewhere, 30, then 30 something was on that lot, but it was MGM. And I, I worked my way through there, and my big lesson is you have to be nice to everyone as long everywhere. I can't really see, but um, you're nodding. Anyway, <laughs> so how did I get to Shondaland? Okay, 30 something, there was an actor on the show named Peter Horton who got to direct. A lot of people started directing on 30 something. Timmy Busfield, Ken Olin, uh, Peter Horton. So I was Peter's AD, and uh, I did you know various work with him. And then I did a show where someone asked me, I'd had my third child, and I was carting the baby to set, <laughs> and being an AD, and feeding him in a honey wagon. And um, someone that I had done a show with offered me to come to work at Showtime as like a vice president. I didn't know what that meant. So I took a sojourn at Showtime and it ended up being eight years, which was great because I then learned, I thought the set was everything. Like who were the other people? We were the people, right? <laughs> I, did, I, did, I didn't know what came before the script came. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so when that ended in, in rollbacks, but, but it was so cheap then, so you learned how to film in many other countries. And um, Showtime, I went back to production, and all these people thought I had like done nothing for eight years instead of worked my butt off and learned even more. And you call everyone, and that actor, Peter Horton, had just directed the pilot for Grey's Anatomy. And he said, and, and another friend of mine was producing it. And uh, the, so the second year of Grey's Anatomy, um, they had another pilot. And he said, I want you to come produce this pilot here. And that's when I met Shonda and uh, Betsy Beers. And I came to do the pilot, but it was something Shonda had written prior. You know this, it's yeah. co war correspondence. Anyway, she'd written it prior to Grey's, and it was about a television network, and it was actually like the head of the network was like head of the hospital, and the head, you know, it was too similar. But anyway, met them. Then time goes by, I did a couple pilots for them, and a series that I produced, and uh, then I, what happened next? I'm trying, oh, so we did, a we did a series, and at the same time, every show I was working on producing, like six episodes canceled, 12 episodes canceled, and I had three kids, and I was, got offered a corporate job at ABC Studios, and Shonda said, take the job, but you will work on all of our shows there. Or you could produce Scandal. So I made the choice because I didn't want the show to be canceled. And now, of course, we're in the seventh year. But I went, <laughs> I went to ABC Studios. But so I, I covered their shows and, and other interesting shows, the harder ones, because otherwise it'd be boring. And um, then Shonda said, I'm forming a company. And if you don't come, I'm hiring someone, but who else is it going to be? So that's how I got to Shondaland. But it's all because when I was an AD and I was nice to the actors, and then the actor became a director, and then you work with him, and then his path took him to Shonda, and then he brought me in. And, you know, I went out with him when I first started Shondaland, and he said, no one ever completes that circle. I said, of course, I have to take you out because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't, you know, for you. So that's how I got there. Yeah. I love that. Do you see why we were like, no, you have to come work at Shondaland. <laughs> Forget that studio, come with us. Well, it's just so nice to, to hear someone who preaches kindness is key and then good things actually happen. You've had such an amazing career. Um, now that we know a little bit about where you ladies have come from, can we talk a little bit about the roles that you're doing today? Um, Allison, you are the head of comedy and drama for Shondaland, which, Goodness gracious, you must have so many responsibilities. It's funny, it does, it's kind of like a, a twofold, right? So I head up development, if you think of it in the big picture way, it's like, how do you get something from an idea executed to the point where then 
we can hand it off to Sarah and the production team and it actually gets made. And so I'm involved from that meeting where an awesome writer we love comes in and sits on the couch and we go, what do you want to write? And they're like, we have no idea. And then we sit and Betsy Beers, uh, my boss will uh, play therapist, we'll get all their best stories out of them. We say, what's the story you've always wanted to tell that no one else will let you tell? And then undeniably, they always are like, well, I always wanted to do a show about X, Y, and Z. And we're like, oh, we should do that. And so a lot of, that's where a lot of it starts. Sometimes it starts with a piece of uh, intellectual property, a book, an idea, a person. Judy Smith, obviously, had come in to meet, and she was the real-life inspiration for Olivia Pope. But it's how do you take that raw material, uh, even sometimes it's as polished as a spec script, but that still needs work, and take it through, um, up until now, solely the broadcast network development cycle and that I don't know if do you guys probably know how the cycles were not so the cycles it's basically traditionally that you go out you pitch you sell your shows in the summer um, as late as like mid to late October you go in there and you've taken those writers off the couch you've worked up a pitch which is really just a sales document say buy our show and then they give you steps to complete a story area where the writer writes it and you make sure, hey, you guys all heard that same thing that they pitched in the room, right? Good, we're all on the same page, awesome. Because sometimes we are not. And then you're sent to out, you know, you'll go in and pitch and it'll be this great experience and you get out and they're like, so this person's the lead. And you're like, oh no, uh, we better all have a conversation. Um, and then once everyone's agreed that this is the show they've bought, the writer goes off to outline and then gets notes on that from both studio network and then off to draft. And then you wait in around holiday time, around this time, uh, in January to hear who's gonna get to make a pilot. And then, so my first cycle, we had six shows in the hopper. This is when I first started. Uh, and five of them were one hours and one was a comedy, a half hour. And How to Get Away with Murder was in that first batch of shows we developed. Pete Nowak, what a magical man. We call him the unicorn. He literally came in and sat on the couch and was like, here's an idea for the show. And it was basically, that was the pilot. Um, miracle. Uh, so basically, we had worked on that. We made the pilot in Philadelphia, came back, went through a lengthy post uh, season in like April. And then again, you go in, you do a song and dance, you talk about what the series would look like or the first season, and you wait and see if they'll pick it up. And so then you get the pickup at Upfronts in May, and then it goes into production. And I usually stay on through season one at least in the capacity of like, I am at every table read, I am also helping oversee all the staffing, all the director booking, trying to get a room and a show up and running on that level creatively. Writer's room, that's what we, have. yes, that's the staffing that I oversee, thanks for clarifying, basically like reading hundreds of writers, narrowing it down, who do we wanna meet? Ooh, we actually like that person, that person is terrible and can never be left alone in a room with Shonda. You do those things, you figure it out, you're like, okay, these are the people who should then meet the showrunner, or Shonda and Betsy, and then pulling the room together from there. And I have great colleagues, Gazal and Marco, who help with all of that, because it is a lot, kind of straddling developing, development and current. And then obviously something, you know, we wanna do more even than just hour longs. Obviously half hour has been a priority for us, features, who knows what else. And so technically, creatively, that is, I'm just overseeing all the beginning stages until it can really get up and running. And then I get to just go to table reads and sometimes they'll throw me apart. Remember I was an actor. And I'll be like, ah, oh, this is so fun. That's like one of my favorite parts of the job. So that is how I stay involved in like season four, <laughs> begging for roles. <laughs> Allison, it sounds like you have your hands in a lot of cookie jars all throughout the process. Sarah, how would you s describe your role within the company as head of production for Shondaland? So, I'm the one that gets really annoyed with them <laughs> because you can't prep what you don't have. And we are notoriously tardy. It's not a good trait at Shondaland. So, um, let me, th uh, so I'm like you can't rush creativity, Sarah. It's gonna be great. We have an air date and we have a budget to catch. So have to push the table read one more but, day, right? It's fine. But you guys do so well with mid-season premieres. I've just got to say, you do really well with winter premieres. Yes. Knock on wood right now. This is man. true. We have two shows coming out. Oh, we don't trust even have me. one. You guys always we have two more shows. <laughs> exactly. Um, I can't remember the beginning of what you asked me. Talk to me a little terrible? bit just yeah. about your role. Oh my gosh. So, uh, we have five shows now. Four of them are produced by pairs of women producer and women production manager. The fifth one had a woman. She had to leave. 
and it was right to promote the production manager. That was a couple years ago. But he knows he's always with a harem. Um, <laughs> but I think that because it was really a struggle for me when I came up, there was like one woman on any show. And if they hired the one woman, that was it. Okay, we hired you. Nobody else was there. So I really feel like when women are in a position to hire, we have to hire other women. So that's the beginning of my job. You know, we get the script. We Same as any production. We figure out where we're going to film. Um, we're very lucky that Shonda was able at our ABC shows to film in L.A. because she made the edict. You know, most people have to go to Atlanta, New Orleans, but like now it's really Atlanta. Um, so we're here, we have our five shows here. We did one show overseas last year because it was a period show set in the 1500s, Italy. So we shot in Spain. But other than that, we're here. So I do, my day to day is almost, is definitely more than, not that I talk to them every day, but my, my majority of my time is spent with the producers on the show. So I try to also find studio space for us in our little orbit so that it's not too far to drive between every everyone. So once we hire the producers and then we're staffing, it's very important to us to have diversity in our crews, which is not as easy as you think it would be even in LA because it's super busy everywhere. And there isn't yet the next level of people that are trained when the top level is busy. So um, you can imagine I'm very critical to myself of <laughs> the assistant directors and the UPMs because everyone looks at from where they come up. So very much on top of that for them. And we have to work to budgets, but to me, I don't... I don't tell too many, well, I've told them, but you know, I'm not the best in math, and I'm not a numbers person. I look at the whole big picture and figure out how we can do it for what the studio wants to spend, and we go over, and then we'll go under, but the more, more important thing is to not stifle any of the creativity and roll with the punches when everything is delivered late, everything. And, uh, but it's amazing when we get it. And also once we have a rewrite, it's worth the wait, as Allison just said, it's worth the wait. It's like stomach ache inducing, but you know, it's worth the wait. And what I like is that every day is different. Like uh, every day is completely different from the day before. And uh, that's- and There's another part of your job that you do, which is that Sarah Fisher knows everyone in the world. Literally, sort of. you, can, you can tell her any kind of arena we're thinking about a show. She's like, I actually know someone very high up at that exact organization. So that's a huge way. Oh, I think not yet. Okay. I don't know. I, I'm I don't just know. saying Maybe that. You'd such a good, oh, surely. Things am. happen in your life. You have to be nice to everyone yes. because you could work with them in this world, yeah. which I did, and we can't announce it yet. And the person from that life, I keep saying 20 something years later, but it's a lot longer, you know, comes back yeah. in your other life and you're able to make a complete circle because you treated people fairly and honestly and stayed above board and kept, you know, you could call someone after 30 years and they would respond to you. So I, I think in our business, that doesn't happen enough. And the most important thing, like anybody I've ever mentored, I've just said, you have to be nice to everybody and you have to take the extra second to, you know that the craft service guy has a special needs child. You just ask them, and then you ask it because you want to know, and then five years later, they show up on one of your shows, and you need a favor, and they'll do anything for you. Not that you're nice to get a favor, but... but even nice. assistance. I know that there's like a lot of... You know, people are hard on assistants or thoughtless about assistants. And having been an assistant for many, many years, I always think about that. I'm trying to like anticipate like how... If I were to say this to their boss right now, how might that reflect that? Can I spare them any kind of grief or things like, because those small gestures, they do go a long way. And that assistant's definitely gonna be my boss in like 15 years. And I just have accepted that that's how this works. So you've got, you know, like you're always gonna be working with the same people in different ways. We touched a little bit about how so many of the amazing Shondaland shows 
represent women so wonderfully. This is a production company that really puts women first. Why do you feel like you guys have done that? Why cater so much to women? It's so refreshing. Well, well, I'll tell. I'll just tell you something because you weren't there. Shonda said today, you know, the world is fifty-one percent women, and we expect our shows and our crews and our everything, top to bottom, to be reflective of that. And um, you know, it's interesting when you're working for matriarchy because hardly anyone gets. Well, more and more people, but in our business, hardly anyone gets to work. Um, in a matriarchy with someone that no, has, ha, has earned the stature that she has earned so that people don't question. And we're very lucky that when we go in, we go in at the top mm -hmm. of everywhere we go and people want to work with us. And so when we say we're going to hire this woman and that woman and this woman and no, nobody questions us. Yeah, and Sean and Betsy did just, they said, I mean, obviously, I've only been there five years. Sean and Betsy set this template of creating great, awesome creative content for women, starring women with women creating it long before, I, I'm not going to pretend I invented it. Uh, the reason it appeals to me to work there, to go to work every day, is because I know how much TV I will watch, and I will be loving it, and I will be in, and then there will be some terrible plot point, or some terrible, th I'll just say it, uh, a rape suddenly changes a character's motivation or a female character out of nowhere does a 180 and completely changes who she was. She was a professional woman and now she's doing something insane that does not make any sense. And I'll always think to myself, like, I bet no one went that, I bet there is one poor woman in that writer's room being like, you guys, no, you guys, please, I swear to God, that wouldn't, okay, okay, no, no, no. Oh, we're gonna introduce her that way? Oh, cool. Uh, she's in se having sex, great. Uh, and I just, I think about... <laughs> I think about that. A friend of mine had started a Twitter feed that was like literally just the character intro line in every script for every woman. And it, it's horrifying. It's always like, Jenny, 28, cute, but doesn't know it. Or it's like, <laughs> Sabrina, 40, she's the kind of girl you don't mind seeing leave from behind. And I'm like, could we please? So I feel like being exposed to this many scripts every day, this much TV, because you're always watching to know what everyone else is doing, it's so refreshing to be like, oh, we don't even have to think about it. They're just humans. And that, that does go for also like race, religion, sexual orientation. The thing that I think is so remarkable about what Sean and Betsy started even with Grace is it's all colorblind casting. It's just we write humans. Um, certainly when we cast an actor, in every way that the way that actor inhabits the role starts to factor in. Obviously, we're not ignoring who they are and what they bring to the role, but it's really, really interesting to, to do it that way. And it leaves you open to just like hire the best actors and explore all the narrative possibilities. So uh, props to them. It's just great fun to work in that environment. Well, and I've had the pleasure of interviewing Shonda many times throughout my career, and I'll remember the very first time I was an intern at E, and um, I was so excited. I was such a big fan of Grey's Anatomy and Scandal, and I went up to her, and I was like, you know, it's so amazing to see so many real strong women on your show. Why is that important for you? And she just looked at me, and she goes, I don't know a single woman that isn't strong, that isn't real. Why would I not have a show filled with them? And at the time, I was like terrified. I was like, I've upset her. <laughs> <laughs> but I went home and it, and it stuck with me and, it, and it's made it so I'm like, I'm not going to ask that question anymore because there should be we're real, strong, amazing, multifaceted women on TV. And I'm so glad that this production company is really putting that in the forefront. Yeah. Um, so continuing off of that, as you're moving forward, what are the stories that you guys are really looking to share within Shondaland? Is there something that you guys are really searching for maybe with this upcoming pilot season? Um, you know, that's, I mean, obviously there's so much in the hopper that I wish I could talk about that I can't yet, obviously, which said that moment of realizing maybe we shouldn't bring that up here uh, for the first time. But I mean, so here's something that I've been thinking about, and obviously we've been, we've been working on a project. Um, so we announced uh, in the summer that Alan Heinberg, who wrote Wonder Woman, uh, and the catch for us, one of our Shondaland shows, uh, is doing um, an adaptation of Russell T. Davies' two BBC Four shows, Cucumber and Banana. Now, when I tell you that the third show is called Tofu, I think you're going to kind of get an idea that this was a show about sex. And it's a show that does not hold back. And the, the star of the show is a gay man. 
And obviously, as we were adapting this, I did sit back and go like, wait a minute. What show on broadcast TV or is just a, the, the protagonist is a gay man? And I like, I honestly, you guys can tell me if I'm completely missing something, but I did think about it for a long time. Like, how is, how is that not the situation? Like a drama. Um, so that's something that I'm very interested in as we continue to develop the show adult behavior. We'll see what happens with it. Who knows? Um, still waiting for an answer. But like, I think that speaks to the fact that of how we approach development in general, right? It's like, okay, what is not on TV? A lot of people are like, well, how can we make the next Stranger Things? How can we make the next like Unreal? What's the next Empire? And I think what's so cool, again, about the trickle down of what Sean and Betsy's vision is, is like, do not sit there trying to think, how can you like imitate something else? What is the show that is not on the air that you would watch the crap out of if it were, and you can't believe no one's done it yet, and then you're onto something. That's something where you're like, wait a minute, that's American audiences would love that. Um, so that's a piece of it for sure. That don't get told. That's again. That's why we bring writers in and go. What's the show that like for five years, every studios been, and network execs been like, ah, oh, you probably that won't work. Shows in that space don't work. You can't do that. We try to figure out a way you can. Right. And then also just a little side note. There is a show coming out mid season on CBS starring Alan Cummings, and he is a gay man. Wait, what show is and that? And he's a lead. And the name is escaping me right now. And I've been that's, on their set, and I feel terrible right that's now. That's great. Um, but yeah, so it's Alan Cummings and Whoopi Goldberg, and and it's coming out. And More he, of that. Yeah, he just That's so happens to be a gay man. And That's it's, awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, he steps in the right direction. <laughs> um, I'm curious. I think we should be past that, but <laughs> yeah, here. exactly. We're finally here. Uh, I'm curious to know how many pitches do you hear for shows a year? Uh, it really varies. Uh, it's tons. I, I probably hear, especially like back when we were solely in the broadcast network space before the Netflix deal and stuff too, it would be like you would hear maybe three or four pitches a week, two to three, and then it would kind of trickle in maybe one or two a week otherwise. But the, the, hard, the way I try to keep the number low to make sure that I'm not like completely overwhelmed and that I'm truly just considering the stuff that feels like it really could go forward is uh, I only meet with a writer to hear a pitch if there's a sample on the page already, play, script, short film, whatever, that I like love. And the reason is it's really hard to pass on a pitch once you get that person in the room and you love them. So even, so that's the thing, it's like you could love the idea, but if you're not sold that this is the person, right, that you could go all the way with, that you could, I could march them into Sean and Betsy be like, look what I found, this guy is amazing, this woman is incredible, then I kind of don't even wanna hear the pitch in a straight, so that's how I try to keep it like manageable. Um, and then we're not really a, in a volume business. There's a lot of producers that will sell like 10 to 12 shows every um, broadcast development cycle and I'm like good for them that is amazing where we've been more like in the three to six range and it's because again I think when Sean and Betsy had been through the experience of having a show that's now in its 14th season you better love that show that you just sold right like why work on anything that you don't like really love and really see going the distance so that really does help keep the number of pitches a little tighter Sarah, at what point do you get a new show on your desk that you're reading that pilot script? Has it pretty much gotten that green light? Late. I told you. <laughs> at the very last late. minute. <laughs> poor, I get them late. Sarah. Um, but that makes it more challenging. So uh, I get it when, usually when they feel a script can go to the studio and the network. That's when I get it. And uh, uh, because... Getting picked up sometimes depends on what anyone thinks it's gonna cost. So you have to have some idea of where you're gonna go. Plus, we're very happy that we're getting out of broadcast over to Netflix because the broadcast system, which Allison told you about when she hears the pitches, the networks picked up the shows later and later and you have a hard deadline because of the up advertising upfronts at the beginning of May and the you back that up from the beginning of May and then they have an evaluation period and testing and back, 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 back. So you have to deliver an hour drama usually by the third week in April, sometime the fourth week of April. Sometimes they don't pick these up until the beginning of February. And you have, you know, you on a brand new show, the fact that this has to be rushed, this whole system is broken in the broadcast. But we... Um, so we would get a script then and then hopefully figure out 
where we were going to film it. And then so you start hiring directors. Everyone's competing at the same time. You have sometimes only seven weeks, sometimes six weeks to prep them, which is not enough time. And then you shoot for maybe two 12 or 14 days. So I try to get it as early as I can. I'm always like, can I read it? Can I read it? Can I read it? Um, and uh, if I beg enough, usually I get a copy from well, them. Usually you know everything we're taking out and selling. You can get ahead yeah, of it in the, terms of like I know, the yeah, big the picture world. stuff. But yeah, yeah it yeah. is. It's tough. Allison, here's my question for you. If you get the script to Sarah and she doesn't like it, what happens? Um, I it's never it's really never happened. happened. Okay. It's, I like everything. I yeah, like you have everything. questions, which yeah. is fair. Yeah, yeah. Like in terms of like, how did this get here? This piece of it, what happened in the process? Uh, is some of this going to change? But what like, happened to the baby? You know, sometimes <laughs> stuff happens. What, what happened like, to the baby? I, this I try all this kids on okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I try to be the viewer sometimes because yes. they are so it's into good. it. Yeah. Because they've been hearing it every step of the way, and sometimes they. You need like an outside person that knows nothing about it to go, hey, what about, you know, this or that? And you need, yeah, fresh eyes, fresh horses. But yeah, that's not, we've been, and again, at every, at every stage along the way, even as these ideas are hatching or things are, elements are coming together, like, oh, we have somebody interested in directing or writing it. You're aware. So uh, we try to have those conversations of like, if anyone objects, speak now, forever hold your peace very early on so that things don't have a runaway quality to them, you know? And I have to say, in the acting side, we, when it comes to casting and working with the actors, we have one casting director on all of our shows, Linda Lowy. And, but yet, we, I feel like we in production spend much more time with actors than, you know, Allison and, but they, they, everybody knows everybody and basically no one has time to sit on set, but you, you know them at the read-throughs and events, whatever. But Sometimes we wind up developing projects with them. Yeah. And then you but, get to know them and more. And we so. have particularly close casts on our shows. But what I was going to say is sometimes it comes up where I have to say that person misbehaves. Again, circling back to being professional and nice. You know, where we were able to say that person is not going to be a Shondaland type actor. They're not going to be a good number one on a call sheet. You know, they're not going to set a good tone. That doesn't happen there very much. But when you work at a small company that has a lot of clout and does a lot of shows, that is also an important voice to be heard. We don't want any lemons in the bunch. Um, let's talk a little bit about the casting process. Is there something that an actor can or maybe should not do that will affect how they're going to move forward in that process? Um, it's so funny. I only have access to very short windows of casting experiences, uh, you know, during a pilot, really. So I'm not there, you know, Grey's episode 13, 12. I'm not sitting in the room and or watching all the tapes. That's a machine that's a train that's gone on without me, right? Um, and I'm always delightfully surprised as a result when guest cast shows up and I'm like, what? Oh, we got them. It's nice. It keeps it really fresh. I'm still just, especially in grays where I'm like, I'm just a fan. Uh, so in terms of a pilot process, I think being kind and and not, there is there's a demeanor in, in the sense of like, once you've gotten to the producer's room, which is all I can really speak to, because that's the only thing I'm there in. I feel like it's being respectful of people's times, reading cues, that kind of stuff is great. Just to be, to not get in there and sit down and be like, oh my God, let me tell you. Let, I've had people sit down and be like, just do this and like tell crazy stories. And we're like, oh, we definitely need to see like five more people in the next hour. I don't know what's gonna happen. So it's it's that, it's just being respectful of that. Um, we've had instances where I've, and this is, I get it. I'll, sometimes younger actresses will come in like, it's a red carpet event, like full hair, makeup, the five inch heels. And I'm like, oh my God, we're Shondaland. If you get like a pass anywhere, it's here. We, we don't, it's coming, just do, do you. And if that's the way it makes them feel great, then great. But it, I wonder sometimes, I'm like, is there a pressure that you feel like, good God, aren't you exhausted that you have to like go do this before every, uh, again, why I couldn't be an actress, I would lose my mind. Um, especially casting a comedy pilot, that was very interesting because people would be like coming in sweating, changing outfits because they've been to 18 during pilot season, like in one day. And it's just a matter of like, I, I think 
I think there shouldn't be that pressure on women, especially, to ha feel like you have to be like fully, fully done. At least not in Shondaland. Um, but outside of that, like you know, leave it all in the field. You never know if you're going to get in that room. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys this. You're professionals. You know what this is like. I mean, it's it's if that might be your one chance, like just do it. Be you. There's so often, so many times where people come in and like want to be the character, and, and so often we'll fall in love with somebody because of who they are, and that's that just comes through. Oh, Gina. So Gina Lee Ortiz, who, do you guys know her? So yeah, had been one of the stars of Rosewood. Not personally. I, she's lovely. <laughs> you will love her. Uh, she is obviously the star of our, obviously, she's a star of our Grey's Anatomy spinoff. And how uh, we came to find her is she came in for a meeting on another project. And the, the show creator was like, I'm not sure this person's the one for this. And then Betsy and Shonda were like, wait a minute. <laughs> this person is our star of the spinoff. It was it was like, so that's the thing. I feel like much as almost in any part of Hollywood, right? Where you, ne there's only so much you guys can control. Any of us can control, right? You go in, you be respectful, you leave it all in the field. And you know that at some point, the right thing's going to happen. I that That's definitely like that zenness of it. We have that happen all the time. Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, I'm in Sarah. Uh, no. Sarah, you tell him. Sorry. I'm not getting so, in trouble. Well, I wasn't there. I were you, I don't know if you know if you were there. But I anyway, was, I wasn't even there actually. Were, so, Gina came in name? and um, only Linda only lets the producers in at the final final on pilots. Uh, uh, the rest of the time doing series, it's just all uh, video. Even the episodic directors don't go. But Gina came in to in audition for one of our show, other shows for a regular role, and they loved her for the spinoff. No script, nothing had been announced. She didn't know it's a firefighter show, but you know I think they told her that she maybe. Did that. And she got to really she got to sit down with Stacy. There was I no believe. script. She yeah. was negotiating with another studio uh, for an overall deal at for I think very good money also, but she they convinced her in the room and it was the quickest, it was like 15 minutes or something like that and she was gonna be a regular on another show. So that's that was a cool casting story. Yeah, Which I'm sure you guys are no stranger to, the like you get called in for one role, they bring you back for another, like it, it's, a, it's a good thing. And Shondaland, God knows we have like a troop of actors basically, people, Repeat, you guys know, show up on multiple shows. Once we once we love you, you're not going anywhere. That's how we stole Sarah Fisher from ABC Studios. Don't worry about it. Just steal you. Just stay nice. Just steal you. <laughs> um, we know that we are in the day and age of peak TV. There are, goodness, I think we're up to 500 original scripted shows that premiered in, two, in 2017. As a TV reporter, it's hard to keep up. Um, <laughs> I can imagine. But so what I'm curious about is, gosh, just from the beginning of Grey's, there we were 14 years ago. You guys have watched how this has evolved, just even as a fan, and now coming into Shondaland. How do you even approach TV now when it's an oversaturation of great shows, but there's broadcast, there's cable, there's premium cable, there's streaming, there's, I don't know, random apps now have things, YouTube. What is that like for you? Is that daunting? It's so funny you say that too, because literally when, the Gra when Grey's premiered, I was in grad school for writing, and I fell in love with it so instantly, I'm like, I'm gonna spec an episode of Grey's Anatomy. I can do this. No, I can't. Uh, I got in there and I was like, oh my God, medical stories, this, how do they do this? I'm going to write an OC. And I did. <laughs> I was like, I'll write an OC where Sandy takes Seth in summer to visit colleges. It'll be called the UC. It'll be great. I would watch that. <laughs> right? I was like, come on, that's an all right episode. But I was like so bowled over. I'm like, what? Breaking apart a, a show to try to write, you're like, God, how do they do this? But it was appointment television. I live with a bunch of law students at UT. We all would like sit down on a Sunday night and watch it. And it just, it's true. That was like, there were only a few shows that just everyone that watched was and Thursday talked about. Thursday night show. Yes. And, um, and now... I get you know what I would say too about Grey's because I watched it also as a fan and then I told you when I went with Peter Horton it was the second year and I didn't want to meet the actors <laughs> I just wanted it to be you know Grey's in a hospital so that was a bit of a bummer but um, <laughs> the 
what the great thing about Grey's, and I don't know if you've stuck with it, this year is amazing. And it's a totally different tone. And it's shaken up. We have a new showrunner who came back. She was the, around for yeah. five or six I e- seasons. Eight seasons even. Yeah. Say or seven, yeah. or, or she was gone for seven, and she was there for six. Whatever, she's back, Krista Vernoff. But they're so enthused there, and you know there's been some attrition and new actors. So I feel like you have to reinvent yourself, and we try to do that a little bit behind the camera because what's the compl- uh, familiar? Not familiarity breeds contempt, but compla- complacent. You know, it becomes complacent. You know, when you've been there the same guys on the same show, and also we do 24 episodes. This is a universe where most shows are 13. Cable is between eight and 10 and 12. 24 episodes. Um, they have a big writing staff, and that also has changed. And they're, and literally, the woman who's the showrunner on the spinoff of Grey's was an assistant on the pilot of Grey's and a writer's assistant, I think, or Shonda's yeah. assistant. Shonda's assistant. Shonda's assistant. assistant. Yeah. Then she became a writer's assistant. Then she became a writer. She eventually rose to be an EP on uh, Grey's, and now she really a cr- show. created a show. Stacey McKee is her name. She's great. Stacey McKee. Yeah, and it's funny too because you'll say that about like I can't tell you how many people. Maybe I'll just meet them in passing. They'll be like, "Grey's Anatomy is still on," yeah. and I'm like, "Look." Uh, Utah, like, I think about all the, yeah, and I think about all of the, like, cable short order seasons I'll watch, right? And season one, I'm like, this is amazing. I love this. I watch it in, like, a weekend. I watch, whatever. And then the second season will come out, and I'm like, ah, what ha- what happened? And to go 14, not to toot our own horn, what are we, we're just fans. 300 Four, episodes. 14, yeah, 300 episodes, 14 seasons. That's really hard. And I think that is as like, as you think consistently, like surely the pe- the way peak TV, I think affects us the most, not not so much about like, are there any ideas left? Or we've talked about that. Like we'll, we'll always find stuff I think that you can break through the clutter. It's more the production concerns. It's like, oh right, how we're gonna we need writers, we need actors, we need people on these sets, and you're again just competing mm-hmm. with five hundred. I don't, I truly don't know how you do your job. Trying to, when people ask me what are you watching, I like break out into a cold sweat. I'm like, quick, <laughs> what's the, okay? You got the two co- you have your talking points, Allison. I'm like, I, there's too much, but the the c- competition for stage space, what everything you and I and writers, it's tough. It's, and also what's interesting now, and it's good, it's good for actors and it's good for writers, but like younger writers now will more and more have a couple of deals going or cable writers will work on two shows because the seasons are short and, and at odd times at the same time. So they're getting great experience, they're getting chances to develop sooner than they would have 14 years ago, but, um, but it is very, it's incredibly overwhelming. Well, in today's day and age, you know, it used to just be that basic cable was like the holy grail. Like that's where you want to be. But now all the shows that everyone's like talking about, it seems like are like Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, like they're popping up out of nowhere. Um, And Shonda Land, Shonda just inked a multi-year deal with Netflix where you guys are going to be developing multiple shows with them. Does it just feel like a weight has been lifted in terms of restrictions? Like, what has that been like for you guys from a production standpoint? I'm not there yet in production because they're developing. So they first have to announce their slate, which they're working on, which Allison can address, and then it'll turn to production. But I already know from friends that produce for Netflix, plus I'm part of a large uh, women's Production Society of Women's Production Exec from the giant majors to Annapurna, Amazon, good universe. There's so many companies I haven't heard of. Um, so we all talk. So I know it's going to be so much better. Well, and I even think about like, you know, I've gotten, I've worked on post for five different pilots for new shows, I think in the five in, in the one hour space. And I know what it's like to try to get a pilot to time. And that 42 minutes is just like, no, oh, there's how are we ever going to get this last 18 seconds out? Like, and the editors work magic and everyone puts their heads together and I'll watch things on Netflix and I'll be like, well, that was a one and a half hour pilot. That was a 37 minute pilot. That was a 52 minute episode. I was watching Mindhunter and I was like, that was truly 38 minutes. 
this is remarkable. So that's fun. The idea that the content will just drive the format is really interesting. Um, but yeah, it's- You won't have to worry about side flank, which is a right. very or big thrusting. broadcast <laughs> standard note. Sure, no side, side flank. They're flank. very worried about side boob, you guys. Very worried. Um, you know, there's those things. You gotta deal with BSMP stuff. So, those, and it's funny because um, obviously, you know, we'll be doing Shondaland feeling shows at Netflix. Um, our brand will continue on, but it'll be fun to kind of let those restrictions go a little or a lot. <laughs> I remember uh, some of the steamier scenes in the first season of How to Get Away with Murder. Uh, I was so excited to see those, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a breakthrough for broadcast television scene. Two guys have a really hot makeout scene right now, so I can only imagine what you guys are going to do full throttle at Netflix. The, the line, he did things to my ass that made my eyes water. I'm still like, yeah. that was, yeah, that, all right. How, was there a lot of back and forth in that? Sorry, just let me I don't know. I'm not, part, I'm not like part of any of those conversations. That happens at a level above us. But I'm always standing up and cheering when something gets, you know. I'll tell you that, uh, something you weren't in there today, but um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Shonda got a, uh, what was it at the TV Academy? Like oh, Lifetime Hall of, Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. So um, the man who said a post at Shonda Land today was joking with her, saying, Shonda, it was so nice of you to invite so-and-so, who's the ABC broadcast standards and practice guy, because all they do is yell, and she is screaming fights over what we can say or what we can't say, woman abortion, um, you know, a woman doing something that they let a man do. I mean, she said, he actually gets me more on my toes that one day she was going to write a book, you know, emails from so-and-so or whatever, <laughs> back and forth. But she invited him. You know, there was a limited number of guest lists, she, and she invited this guy because she said, over the years, I've gotten very close with him, yeah. broadcast standards and practices. So we'll, ha we'll have something my a little favorite, different. Though, my favorite was that we definitely, um, there was like a tapestry on a wall in a castle in Spain. Do you remember this? A mural. And somebody figured out that you could see male anatomy on it. And I was like, how do they even see so these still things? Star still star-crossed. I was like, I would never have even, but they've, but they've got to be, you know, they've got to be tough on it. So that'll be really interesting. It'll also be interesting. I don't know what the rules are at Netflix because I spent those, that time at Showtime and we did Queer as Folk, which had, you know, there had never been gay sex shown on any kind of television. And they had to form their own BSMP. It was like two lawyers and someone in New York who's maybe a lawyer, and they literally came up with how many thrusts we were going to show and what kind of nudity because there was no FCC for it. So I don't know what the Netflix world is. I'm in not that. sure on the number of thrusts. I will find out. <laughs> oh, I, I know how many thrusts it was, but I don't know at Netflix. I know it's Showtime, three. <laughs> three. <laughs> three thrusts. A lot of discussions about that. <laughs> a fly in that room um i'm curious to know because shonda rhimes is the showrunner she's so sensational when i was at the Grey's anatomy 300th all the actresses could not stop gushing about what an amazing tone that she has set that betsy is now as equally as amazing in shonda land what do you guys look for within a showrunner what brings that executive producer to that level um, that's a really good question, and it's actually it can be different different things. Like there are there it's there's sometimes what do you look for in a show creator, um, which is a com an utterly strong vision and voice, um, a, a real sense of they can they can do more than just come up with an idea for a pilot, right? Like that person has the 100 episodes in them. That person has a passion. Um, that person is awesome to work with. We definitely still have a no asshole policy in place at Shondaland. Um, and for good reason. It, it, you spend a lot of hours with that person and it's our job to make sure that person's vision gets on the screen. And so it has to be a mutually supportive, awesome relationship. And we've been very lucky in that regard. Um, but then sometimes in the more strict sense of the word showrunner, um, sometimes when a writer has not had as much experience technically as uh, somebody else might who's creating a show, you will bring in an upper level writer called a showrunner. And the reason there's that delineation is in the first year of a show, the creator is not just churning out scripts with the room, it's he's, he or she's making decisions on every single thing from a blazer to how trans, like all transpo questions, like everything that comes up to them somehow randomly, they will have to address 
And so sometimes it helps with somebody who has not done it before to have someone who can both be a huge help in the room, but also on those production, kind of be their brain and their ears and their eyes on set, in post, at casting, what have you. So um, in those re- in those regards, when you're trying to bring someone in to help the creator, you want to find someone who is not there to like, I guess, um, take over the show, yeah. uh, quiet the voice of the creator who's very good with the idea that like, they're coming in to support, but they're also coming in to run and to lead. So you're looking for someone, and look, we do a ton of research. Again, Sarah Fisher knows everyone. It's always good to go around the office and talk to people like, oh, we're considering so-and-so to come be the showrunner. Um, Do you know anyone who knows them? And then you call that person, you have a conversation. How did it work out on that show? You do your homework um, and make sure they are a good leader and that they are collaborative. TV is such a collaborative medium, and this goes for show creators and showrunners because there are budget concerns, there are location concerns. You lose actors at weird points. You have to be very nimble. And that's a Betsy word, but like it's it's very true. Nimble showrunners, that's the real key, very adaptive. And I would add, and Alice, you can say about the background, but just, we have five shows now, and I was just sitting here thinking in my head, all the showrunners on the new shows grew up on a, a different Shondaland show. Yeah. Um, Mark Fish, who's running Scandal now in the in the writer's room, he was a researcher when I produced Off the Map. Oh, right. Yeah, I, and, you know, he came up that way. Um, Pete Nowak, who created How to Get Away with Murder, he wrote on both Grey's Anatomy and Scandal. As did Alan Heinberg. A- Alan Heinberg wrote on Grey's Anatomy and Scandal. Um, what am I for? Uh, Paul, Paul Davies, Davies, who's doing our new show for the people, was a writer on Scandal. Stacey Stacey McKee. Stacey McKee on the spinoff. Am I forgetting anything? uh, And Krista Vernoff was a writer on on Grey's and she came back. Is that all the shows, I think? So um, they're all, they all grew up in the family. And also there's growth so that when, you know, even the writer's assistant job, which sounds like, okay, it's a shitty first job or whatever, but it in Shondaland, oh, so many of them go on to be staff writers. In fact, the PA at Shondaland who came out of the VA Writers Guild program. Oh, right. Julie she, Conway, yeah. She, so she, she was literally... Air Force? I think she was in the Air Force. Yeah, and answering the phone and getting people lunches. In Shondaland. In Shondaland. Then she moved over, and I don't know if you saw the episode. It was episode five. 1405 yeah, this year. It was... Um, what ha- well, you see a flashback to Owen and his sister and how his sister got um, separated and taken away when they were fighting in Iraq. She wrote that episode. So it was like a complete circle and we were able to do a PSA for the VA, for the vets that she also wrote that went on that episode. So it, it, it's, it seems like a good, if you're that young, like not if well, you're older, but if you can put in the time, put in the time and, make, you know. and do a good job, you... you you write, you rise. And another just really fun story is that we had um, a blind script submission contest amongst all of the assistants and PAs on Scandal um, a few seasons ago. Just to take the cover off, we don't know, want to know who wrote what. Five scripts, we'll read them, and whoever wins will be writer's assistant in the room. And we read one of the features, and we're like, "Oh my god, I laughed, I cried. How can we make this? What is happening? Did this person live this? This is crazy." Turned out it was a writer's peon scandal named Michelle Lertzman and Shonda decided to just staff her on Grey's Anatomy because it was that good. And she has been on Grey's Anatomy, then she went over to Scandal, now she is on the new show that Paul Davies created for the people. Um, we're developing with her. Oh, the script got sold. And now we're, we're gonna, it's, yeah, it's not fully announced yet, but we are, we're making, you know, we're going to make her feature. You guys are killing me right now because all these little nuggets that you're dropping, the TV reporter in me is like, so what was that? Uh, <laughs> we're developing, you know what Tune I mean? Tune into Entertainment Tonight later. We'll be breaking a bunch of these. And if you guys want to drop the name of the Grey's Anatomy spinoff right now, I'm sure we, no, I'm just kidding. Do you have a name? We'll take it. We call it You Gas. <laughs> Untitled, Untitled Grey's Anatomy spin yeah. <laughs> We're coming up on it, though. When do you guys think Don't you were going to about it. Up? We're testing it. We're figuring it out. You guys at TCA. I mean, it's hard. Grey's Anatomy, what a title you got. You really start to appreciate that one. You're like, wow, it's double meaning. It's certain, I love it. It's, practice was great, too. That's right. That's right. We'll see. You'll, you'll know soon enough. <laughs> <laughs>
I hope. I'm curious to know if you ladies can enjoy other TV shows. You're so in the thick of it and know so much on the production side. Do you find yourself watching shows being like, oh my gosh, why would they choose to do that? Or do you, can you kind of escape? I just watch them and be like, oh, I wish we'd made that. Like, I'll get those little competitive things sometimes. I don't know. I love comedy. I love to watch the opposite of what we do. I love watching talk or news shows. Um, but I, I, I love TV. I feel like if I ever got to a place where I could not watch other TV shows, it's time to leave the business. <laughs> That's the point where we're like, okay, time to go teach. Like, go be a professor somewhere. Like, leave it behind. If you've gotten that sad and angry and weird about watching other shows, call it a day. You had a good run. I go, I go through cycles because I look at a show and if the background is bad, then I can't watch anymore. Like it just doesn't seem like, you know, if they're doing stupid stuff or I'll watch something like Billions. Again, like you said, the first year, then I got bored. But I watch and I go, how the heck are they affording to do this show? How are they affording this? And then my other mind comes in and then the next day I have to call and find out, you know, how much, how much those shows cost. So... I love that. And I'm like, why didn't they bring this pitch to us? Um, call yeah. an ICM. Like, you know, no. like that. It's, it's hard. Like, I try to watch the new shows all once just to see the directing and what it looks like. But it's failed miserably at that lately. Um, you know, too much else to do. So we've reached the point where I will be reading off some of your audience questions right now. Please forgive me if I butcher your names or can't read your writing as well, but here we go. Um, okay. What? Inello Clayton says, <laughs> if at all, and we talked about this a little bit, if at all, do you involve yourselves with casting? If so, how important is it to you? So we spoke a little bit about that, it, that obviously casting is important. Yeah. Well, no, it's great that also, like, I feel like Shonda and Betsy and usually the show creators are very um, open to my feedback. But look, it's not my show. Like, I I feel like the at the end of the day, uh, it's got to be their, their decision in terms of a final move. What I will do sometimes is if I feel like we're hitting a wall uh, and not seeing enough people who feel different or right or what have you, I will start to just throw out some ideas to Linda in terms of like other UCB people I've seen before. Or I saw this person in a play and kind of a, don't have to do anything with it, I'm just saying it, um, no skin in the game. But I do like to try to like get creative and think of is there anyone that they might not have seen just because they might not have as, as formal or aggressive a rep or might be newer or something like that. But I just, I love being even included. It's really awesome and you learn a ton. <laughs> uh, Don writes, can you just pitch an idea without having to write a script before the meeting, then write the script if there's interest? How successful is that? So can you come in with just a nugget of an idea? Uh, only if there's something else you've written that I've loved, per that other thing. Like, did you write a feature? Did you make a short I'm obsessed with? Did you write a play? Uh, have you been a member of a UCB sketch team that I've loved? That's, it's got, there's got to be something to be like, oh, I get your voice. I love it. I can champion it if I love your idea. Uh, from Terry Crawford, she says, and I love this, how did the idea to name episodes after song titles come about for Grey's Anatomy? Do you guys know that? I wish I knew. Uh, I, I can't believe I don't know that actually. Me either, because we were just talk we were just talking about today for a title for one of the shows that would possibly not be a song title, but I didn't go to the next mile. Of, I didn't even realize they were all song titles. So oh, yeah. that's how out of it I was. <laughs> I, don't I don't. I feel bad not having an answer. I don't know. Text Shonda, FaceTimer, what's going on? <laughs> Left my phone somewhere Left else, phone. yes. <laughs> Couldn't possibly. A um, question was from, this is from Beautiful, uh, and she wants to know, what is the project you're most excited for in 2018 and why? Well, that's what sucks. I can't talk about the stuff for 2018. I know. Talk about um, the mid-season ones we have. Well, and obviously, look, I mean, obviously, we've talked about For the People on the spinoff, which are going to premiere mid-season. We've talked about adult behavior, which I think is totally rad. The Alan Heinberg development, um, very much hoping that goes forward. But in terms of beyond that, uh, it's all, it's early stages. We're super I, excited I think that we it, should be, I think we've done it again with two other yes. new ensemble casts. Mm -hmm. And yes. especially... 
on both shows, not even one or the other. You know, we have our senior members on For the People. We have Hope Davis, who's an amazing actress, Vondi Curtis Hall, Ben Anna Shankman, DeVere Anna Devere Smith. Yeah. Then we have a group of younger actors that are less well known. Um, you know, I. I'm not gonna, I could sit here and list everyone's name, but whatever, young group of ensemble. And the same thing on the spinoff. Um, the spinoff, we only have Miguel Sandoval as our nice, older, crusty fire captain. Um, but we have a great group of young, mostly unknowns, I would say. Some from theater too, amazing. I mean, just incredible. And like we have an original Hamilton cast member that we're obsessed with who's right. who's in our in our series and yep. and I think that's what we're really excited about seeing that grow and seeing what the audience thinks of the shows and also it's so fun to see actors go from anonymity and an anonymity <laughs> to recognition that's really wonderful. after a lot of hard work yes yeah, yeah. well and then just to piggyback off of that you've said that if there's an actor or an actress within Shondaland that you love, obviously they will be popping up in other projects. Once you love them, they stay within the family. And I say I produced a failed pilot for Shondaland. What was in Shondaland? Shonda and Betsy. I don't, I'd don't. i have to count how many Inside years ago. Inside the box. Inside the box. So from that show, Jason George went to Grey's Anatomy. Kim Raver went to Grey's Anatomy. Martin Henderson came to Off the Map, and then he came to Grey's Anatomy. One more person. Oh, Sarah Drew. Oh, right. She went from that failed pilot to Grey's Anatomy. So a lot of that is also due to Linda, Lowy, and her, her on her, her players, yeah. um, that go back and forth. And and that's also why Friday Night Lights, which was my favorite show ever, that we got to. Uh, like the show I did in Hawaii off the map, you know, I got QB1, yeah. his first show, Matt, uh, Matt, uh, 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 yeah, uh, Zach, Zach Gilford. Gilford, Zach Gilford. Real I was name. nervous to meet Saracen. him. Oh my God. Saracen. It's QB1. But I mean, Linda had cast Friday Night Lights and we have Friday Night's actors sprinkled. Gray Damon in our show. Uh, from the last season of Friday Night Lights is in the Grey's Anatomy spinoff. Amazing. That's true. Yeah, it's nice. She doesn't forget can, anybody. No. But so I love that. And so it's nice that these faces will continue to pop up. You guys do keep them within the Rolodex of the Shondaland family. But how important is it for you guys, like you were talking about these two new shows, to find those hidden gems, to see those new actors and give them their so shot? Important. Oh, my God. So important. Linda has a staff where she grows her casting service because not a lot of people can cast five shows. Plus, she does, I think it's consulting. I don't know what her title is at TNT. Yeah. But she adds associates to the show so that she's not always, you know, she's not running every night to showcases or looking at tapes from across the country. She does see a remarkable amount of theater, though. It's true. It's crazy. True. I don't know but, she, she, but she has, you know, uh, people that work with her and people that pe put people on tape, too. And we look for glo talent globally. Like, we do not just sit and even not just for Still Star Cross, which, of course, was like an international production. We were like always looking to Australia and the UK and other countries. And, of course, then we're like, Sarah, there's the we need a except work of visa. Course, except, of course, I know. What's when the we deadline? did a show um, in Europe. And then it's all American actors. The, <laughs> one of the guys was from New Zealand. <laughs> that was it. I mean, Australia. No, was it? no, he was from Australia. And another one from Hawaii. And what about all those English actors that <laughs> that work when we're in LA? It's crazy. Yeah, but they, they look all from, over. They span yeah. the globe. There's talent everywhere. Yeah. Um, this is a question from Angela C. And I think that you might be able to speak to this with your acting background. Uh, and she says, how open are you to actors that are multi-hyphenates working in a production or development capacity at Shondaland to learn those skills and contribute in ways other than acting? That's a great question. Um, there's there's a second well, part, uh, uh, too. We'll get to that in a bit. You, you talk about well, this I'm first. just going to tell you right now, Tony Goldwyn's directing. Scott Foley's directed. Kerry Washington is directed. Darby Stanfield. Darby Stanfield is going to direct. Joe Morton is going to direct. So right away, there's however many, five or six actors just on that one show that are directing. Allison can talk to Scott Foley and, um, and uh, oh, Katie, yeah. Katie Lowe's. Lowe's yeah developing yep we had we've we made a comedy pilot for abc called toast that was scott foley's idea he came in and pitched it to us something he and greg grunberg had come up with on the set of felicity years ago 
And uh, he wound up writing a script for it. We got to make the pilot as like a multicam hybrid a la How I Met Your Mother. It was such an insane experience and so great. And on top of that, too, at the same time, we were developing a one hour that Katie Lowe's, her husband, also an amazing actor, Adam Shapiro, and Kerry Washington were all producers on, kind of based on an amalgamation of their real experiences. Katie and Adam ran a nanny ring in LA when they were like aspiring actors out there auditioning. They were also nannying and mannying. And it was it was loosely based on that, kind of an upstairs, downstairs. Um, we have a lot, a lot of that. We've actually just started doing web series as of last year. Talk about the web series. Well, I was just going to say that we were able to try out, sort of, um, you know, actor, well, everybody, not just actors, but starting with the directors, we did uh, six webisodes last season for Scandal, and Darby Stanfield, who plays Abby on the show, she has wanted to direct. So she directed the webisodes. But we also, down the line, like a producer's assistant, was the producer. A camera operator was the DP. We tried to go all the way down the line. And we just finished last week uh, six webisodes for Grey's Anatomy that Sarah Drew, who wants to direct, who who plays April on Grey's Anatomy, directed. And same thing, where we yeah. br brought everybody up. I, I was really insistent on it to be a learning experience for a learning experience and a bonus, especially on Grey's, for people that have toiled there for so many years the ones that have ambition that want to rise up that I feel like the webisode was like a perfect um, uh, way to channel that. Yeah, and I try to just keep an open door policy. Like if you do work on one of our shows, whether you're a production manager, an actor, a director, you have ideas, you want to come talk, Betsy and I will always come here, like hear you out. Like just, you can always come by because great stuff comes from it more, more, more than not. Which leads into the second part of the question, which is how best can a producer present themselves while also acknowledging their skill set is synergized with acting experience? I, I guess I don't understand the question in the sense that it's like, it's like, is it kind of like if you're more known as an actor or a director, how do you then kind of carry yourself and come in and like approach something saying, no, but I also want to produce this? Or is it like, I want to produce this show, P.S. I'm attached to act and direct? I guess that would be the question. The first one, okay, fair Thank enough. You, I think we figured out <laughs> who asked this great question. Um, I think, yeah, you just, if you've, done, like producing is all about doing the legwork, right? Like you've done the homework, you've done the research, you've, if there's like something you want to act in that you want to make, you've, opt you've optioned the material, you've figured out a game plan, you know writers you'd want to target, you've done your, the same work that a producer would do and no one's not going to take that seriously, certainly. Um, and, and if you, the, the one thing I will say, if you've got an idea you want to pitch that you're going to star in, it's tough. It's tough if you don't have um, a big following, if you are not a name, and the only and so sometimes I say to people who are incredibly are incredibly talented in so many ways, I say, look, if you really want to see this show live, and it's not like your own life story, and you could stand to not star in it, you've got real chops here. It's a great script. You should get to do, you maybe consider just saying. I'm attached, but it, it can be negotiable because there's so many, especially younger comedy people, this happens a lot. You're like, no, but I'm going to play the role. And if it's the thing you want to like go to the mat for and dive for, you should stick to your guns. But if there's any world in which you're like, but I could also just be as happy not being in it, 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 it kind of, if you want to be taken seriously as a producer and a writer, sometimes that's very important to be able to, to be able at some point to do what's best for the project. Uh, Andre Walker says, I'm a producer and I have multiple projects that I'm trying to develop, both film and TV. I'm trying to partner with writers so that I can present multiple projects to potential investors and industry contacts instead of just one. Is there a better way to do this? Do you have uh, representation, I guess, would be the question, because I feel like the glue in our business is agents um, and managers, managers who also produce. I feel like those are the people who can... F Foster relationships, introductions, help you with a game plan that's not going to screw you over. Like, help you figure out like how how do I approach many people at once without burning any bridges or legally getting into trouble. Like, that's where agents are so important to help in that. Um, and if you don't have an agent, it would be a matter of asking somebody who's kind of been down that road before finding another producer maybe to talk to about it. I don't know. Do you have any kind of tips on that front? Well, this actually leads this actually leads into our next question, which is 
this actually leads into this one, which is when collecting actor submissions, do you only work with agents or can an actor submit themselves? I, I always try to like send all those to Linda right away too. Cause I, I just, it's, it's easier. It's more consistent. It's great that if everything that comes in is just, it's going through that machine. They're amazing. All of those people will do their homework. They will look at everything. They will watch tapes till three in the morning. We've seen it. Um, so I tend to like write back to people when they've submitted either a client or themselves and say, you seem awesome. Uh, Linda Lowe is the person to talk to about this. This is, so we try to kind of keep it a little church and state. And I think the other thing about going to Linda, or at least I see this from now all my kids, friends, you know, I'm always saying, could you see somebody, you know, sure. if I know that they know how to act. Um, but they keep people on because you'll audition for something at Linda and she'll remember you if if it if it isn't the right role that time they bring the people back they don't forget yeah, they don't. who they see i will tell you one hilarious story and i think she'd be okay with this i have an actress friend who i love dearly and on how to get away with murder in the pilot i put her up for a role i literally just p noah was walking by i was like p can you look at her i kind of think she'd be great for this role and he's like yeah no she seems awesome send her in i was like okay okay i didn't i didn't overstep she went in for some reason, because I'd come from Ellen DeGeneres' co company, she thought it was a comedy. So she, she did her audition, and she laughs about this all the time. We reference the Arrested Development fire sale episode quite a bit. But um, she, because she'd not had the whole script or whatever, had thought it was a comedy and went in with that. She did not get the part. Um, and so I was like, why didn't you talk to me? Why didn't we do more like prep and stuff? And since then, I've been very hesitant. I've just kind of not gotten there. I like to keep it. Sometimes a friend, a dear friend will be like, I got pinned for a Grey's episode and I'll have no idea that it was coming. So we do try to keep it all that way. But come on, that's amazing. She, she can laugh at it now. She's very successful. I've seen the How to Get Away with Murder pilot so many times, so imagining it as a pilot right now, I'm just... <laughs> like comedy I, I just keep picturing that cheerleader spinning over and over and over <laughs> again <laughs> uh, we're reaching kind of the end of our panel time right now and all of your questions have been submitted but is there anything that you ladies would like to add just about your jobs what would you because what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of your job and working with Shonda Land okay for me I could probably think of a better answer if I thought about this but off the top of my head so I'm not an office person. And when I took this job at Showtime, which was something I had to do because I was traveling too much for my work, I had to do it for my kids. And um, my mentor had been Bruce Paltrow, passed away, and he came to lunch with me. And he goes, how is it? You're a big mucky muck, and you have this big office and whatever. I said, you know, I, I don't know. It's like hard to get used to and meetings and everyone in an office. And he goes, once a set rat, always a set rat. And I never forgot that. And it's totally true. I am a set rat. So I have a ton that I have to do in my office all the time and and crazy and run to meetings and production meetings and concept meetings and read throughs. But guess what? When I don't have anything to do, I walk down to the set. I get to watch Viola, at Viola Davis act. And when I see on the call sheet that she's going to do a scene, which has happened in a number of episodes with Cicely Tyson, I go down for like 10 minutes and I get my fill because this is what is rewarding because you see amazing stuff. Or when they hand me a script and say it's 1500s Italy and your budget is this big and it's totally period, where in the world are we gonna film it? And then you find this town three hours west of Madrid that all you had to do is remove light bulbs and put dirt down and you were in the 1500s, and they make the most gorgeous costumes, and you get to see that is really cool. Um, so I feel like that part for me is rewarding. I never think about how much it costs, because it's always okay, and we've been way over budget, and we've been under, and no one gets fired, and everyone's still here, and you know, it's more important that the material, the, you know, that the audience likes it. So for me, it's true. I mean, there's a lot of other actors that I like to watch, but really, when Real, and I really want my fix. I go watch Viola, which is just amazing. Um, oh. Real quick, though, uh, just as a side note, off of the budget thing, do you notice a big change between the transition to Netflix versus broadcast? I only know what it's going to be, and I'm excited <laughs> about it. 
I know, I know what their bottoms are a little bit. You know, I get little crumbs from Shonda because it's not quite ready for production yet. Anything, but uh, there's a lot more money there. And but you can you can't really fault the broadcast networks anymore. They're so in trouble, and everything now is about how much does it cost. And they say now instead of the script being the script, and then you have a budget. Now it's like we're giving you this much money. You have to tell them they have to write to this which is not the way that we work at Shondaland. So the money's very, very tight at the broadcast networks. And also everything costs so much more money. And also, not speaking out of turn for our future production partner, but Netflix, the Amazons, the Hulus have, and I don't know if you see it with acting, but crew rates, they pay crazy. And so people don't want to work for you when you're not paying what they can get on another show. So it's really turned the business upside down. They pay a lot more in every single category and they have less rules. Like ABC where we produce for is part of Disney. Disney has a million rules. Like you can't rent a, I won't get in the weeds, but other places, you're, if you're a transportation captain, coordinator, and you have your own vehicles, you get a lot of money for renting your vehicles to the studio. Why not use your own stuff and rent it? And over the course of a season, a lot of money, places like ABC won't do that. Places like Netflix and Amazon. So they're like, why would I come to work for you? So on top of how many shows it, they are, awesome. it's very difficult to be on the broadcast side, yeah. budget wise. Well, why do you like that? I would just say that it's amazing that you get to help. I, the fact that I actually make a living helping people cre see their creative vision come to life, like tell their stories and watch their faces as they see like the first day on set or the first cut of the pilot or the premiere night and the tweets come in and you're just like so incredibly happy for someone else. It's like being, the fact that you get to be with people on such a crazy roller coaster ride, there's a reason that's our logo. Uh, it Like from the hardest days where you're beating your head against the wall and you have no idea if you'll ever have an ending for this pilot to the most amazing moments of TGIT and stuff, that stuff's crazy. It's just such a rush. And I, again, failed actress, failed writer. I'm just living vicariously. It's so fun to get to be a part of it and not have to do it. Because um, I, I know how hard those jobs are. Thank you very much. So that's just the most, and also the people. I always say this, but I'm like, I feel like if everyone had a Shondaland kitchen at their workplace, where you're just constantly meeting awesome, wonderful, inspiring, surprising people who do not look like you, do not act like you, do not think like you, do not pray like you, any of that stuff, I feel like we'd be in a better place as a country even. I'm just like, I seriously walk in there every time and I'm like, I, I know we're lucky. We live in this bubble and I'm not gonna take it for granted. It's really- I, And I wanna just add too that we didn't talk about this here, but uh, last September, Shondaland created a website, shondaland.com, yes. Shondaland which is edited by a woman that worked at Yahoo and Hello Giggles. So it's a totally different world than us, yeah. right? But this is a new world that we live in, trying to figure out how does our content go to the website, but the website is, political and um, lifestyle and humor a amazing mostly women would you say write the articles would you say yes. but it's an amazing website to look at with the material new new material 12 to 15 articles a week so for me that is also exciting to learn how you make a website yeah. and how it actually works and how it gets out into the world and how you get material for the website it's like interviews with Michelle Obama and then a deep dive into Brandy Cinderella, like an oral history. I'm like, this website's got everything. It's true. It's great. It's true. And also just for actors, I think one funny Shondaland thing that we can tell is that uh, most of our shows, we have read-throughs for every show. They're cold readings for the actors because the scripts are late coming full circle, but we always schedule the read through so we know we have to have something to read or to read through. And to me, my favorite part of any week is watching the actors' faces, especially when they don't know they have to take their shirt off, a guy has oh, to take there was their a shirt big, off. In Scandal, before, oh, oh my Jeff God, Scandal Perry. when ever, anyone could die. There were definitely some times in seasons past where people would just be looking at that last page. And it is cra it is crazy to see their reactions to stuff. I would like hope that. those actors would get the courtesy call. 
and it was became a joke basically yeah. it was it was a joke everyone would just look because god knows if the, people the were murdered thinking. ones got, got <laughs> oh yeah the murdered, the ones, murdered no. ones no everyone else no. is just you and know, they want to decide the how they die like portia de rossi she really was into how she was going to be killed on scandal oh yeah 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 <laughs> beat me with that golf club yeah she was she was but i, I they, they know but nobody else no no one know no one knows the storyline and the yeah, gasps so yeah they gasp so yeah. it's or fun the laughs there's laugh. some good laughs in that room only on Shondaland. Uh, ladies, thank you so much for joining thank us you. tonight. Thank I really you appreciate it. Thank Such you all so much audience. for your amazing questions. Please give them an amazing round of applause. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.